Who says? Have you ever uttered those words? Just by what authority are you trying to tell me to do something? Who says so? Well, I've said those words many a time. Because, you see, I'm a child of the 60s. We were raised questioning authority. Timothy Leary, for those of you that remember, was that proponent of always questioning authority. Never take anything at face value. Rebel. Do anything and everything to make the world different. I can remember in the 60s and 70s, they actually had demonstrations on college campuses. People were upset about the life of uh, our world and about the conditions in which people live. And so it was not unusual at all to see campus after campus torn apart because students of my age were trying to make a difference. And we were taught to question authority. We were also taught never trust anyone over 30. And now that I'm well over 30, that becomes more of an issue. But we were taught that what you say and who says it is important. And so it's important that we understand the authority that, that comes to us. Why do we do what we do? What challenges our faith? When I was growing up and starting in the ministry, if I wanted to just finish off that sermon with just the right finesse, all I had to do was quote Billy Graham. And everyone guessed, oh yes, yes, absolutely. And if I really wanted to seal it with, a, with uh, authority, all I had to do was quote J. Edgar Hoover. Well, those days are long past. J. Edgar is not what he used to be or what we thought he was. By what authority do we do things? That was the question that Jesus was asked that day. By what authority are you teaching? And he says, I'll ask you a question instead. Was John the Baptist a prophet? Was he sent from God or not? Suddenly, the people that were asking the question couldn't answer the question they were asked. The tables were turned, and they couldn't reply. I remember reading the story that Phil, uh, Dr. Phil at one time was asked the question, if you could interview anyone in the world, living or dead, who would it be and why? And Dr. Phil said, I would like to interview Jesus Christ and ask him about the meaning of life. Well, when I read that, I thought, Dr. Phil, no, you really don't. Because if Dr. Phil were to interview Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ would turn the tables on him and before the conversation was over, would tell Dr. Phil that he needed to sell his possessions and give to the poor and take up his cross and follow him. Most of the time, we do not want to have that conversation with Jesus Christ. We probably wouldn't want to have it with John Wesley because he didn't suffer fools. You were either a faithful disciple, you were either committed, you were either doing the work, you were following through, or you weren't. And if you weren't, it was because you were lost. And the only way to come into a saving relation with, with God was to be what God wanted us to be. Jesus turns the question upside down. He has it all, he's turning it around on them. And suddenly they don't know what to do. Jesus avoids the trap. And then he gives a parable. Two sons. The father goes to the first son and says, Son, I'd like you to go to the vineyard today and work. The son says, No, I'm not going. But later, he does. He goes to the second son who says, Yes, I will go. But then never goes. Now substitute cleaning your room for going to the vineyard and you get a better picture of this story. Do we do what we say we're going to do, or do we let it slip through our fingers, slip through our life, and simply make excuses? Because you see, the religious leaders of that day and age had come to the place where they were masters of excuses. They knew how to talk the talk. They could talk for hours and never say anything. 
Have you ever been in one of those meetings? Probably this week, where you talk and talk and talk and nothing is ever decided. We have meetings to plan more meetings to plan more meetings. And it's almost offensive if you decide to do something because then you wouldn't have to have as many meetings. Well, the religious leaders were masters of that. And they knew how to play the word games, much like our politicians today. I'm amazed that when we look at the news and we find out what's going on in Washington, our politicians are full of words, but nothing ever gets resolved. The talk fills the airwaves, but nothing is ever decided. And the more we talk, the more confusing it gets, and the less is accomplished. We live in a day and age where multi-billion dollar industries can go before Congress and say, please don't take our subsidy away because we wouldn't make as much profit as we do now. And they have their defenders. Talk, words, talk, talk, talk. You can go to church. We can pray prayers. We can go through liturgy. We can observe the ritual. We can sing songs. We can listen to the message. And it's all so many words. It doesn't make a change in our hearts and our lives. We come to the place where we parse words, trying to figure out is really is. We try to figure out what's going on in our lives, and we fail. So you talk all day long, and Jesus has a, a remedy to that. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is not for those who simply talk, but it's for those who do. And then he tells this parable, this story of the two sons. He tries to help them to understand that all of the words in the world will not make a difference. It's what we do for Christ. And so the one son who says, no, I will not go, later goes. The second son who says, I will go, but then never does go. And he asks the question, which one? is the correct one, the right one. And they said, of course, the first son. In other words, it's not what we say that's important. We can say anything and everything in the world. We can impress everyone with our biblical knowledge. We can understand the Bible from cover to cover. It really doesn't matter what we say. It's what we do. How do we live our lives? How are our actions changed because we are Christians? And here's a good test for you. Do you drive like a Christian? Well, I hope so. But I'm amazed at how many people don't, and they always have that little fish on the back of their car as they cut me off in traffic and never signal any lane change. It's not what we say it's what we do and that is the problem with life for you see God has called us for more than words Paul wrote in Romans I beseech ye therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that which is acceptable in God's sight. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves a living sacrifice. God wants us to give something. God wants us to surrender something. It's not our verbiage, it's not our words, it's not our intellect, it's not those things that we talk about day in and day out. God wants us to give our lives a living sacrifice on the altar. And as one writer said, one of the problems with living sacrifices is that they have a tendency to creep off the altar. And have you ever made a commitment to God? 
that you're no longer keeping? Have you ever promised to God that you would do something and you never did it? Have you ever said to God that you would be more devoted and more caring and more loving, that you would work harder at putting him actually first in your life? And are you doing it? God wants us to be those living sacrifices that make a difference in our world because we have been touched by the divine and we have gone beyond the words that we hear with our ears and digest with our mind. We go to that place where we feel God's presence in our hearts and we know of his love and his grace. But the problem is we still hide behind our words. We hide behind all of those things that keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Now again, I am often amazed at the timeliness of the lectionary. As Sid has announced this afternoon, we are going to hold our lay leadership committee and we're going to try to fill all the offices and positions in the church, all of those committees. And since all of you are listening to this sermon, you will all, I'm sure, readily agree to serve in some form or fashion. And I hope you will, because it is a part of our Christian service. It is a part of being a part of the church. But it's more than just serving on the committees. It's more than just doing something the church might ask us to do. Because if we're not careful, even that can be a way of avoiding God. No, it's going beyond serving on a position and serving in a committee. It's going to that place where we actually make that commitment that God changes our hearts and our lives. So I will say this, if you would like to serve, if you have not been on the church committee or council, if you have a place that you would like to serve, in the bulletin is listed the various people that you might need to contact and let them know of your interest. Because, you see, the success of this church does not depend upon me. It does not depend upon elected officials. It depends on every single one of us together. If you are a member of First United Methodist Church, you have a holy obligation to do all that you can to see that it is faithfully doing the work of building God's kingdom in this community. It is a call of making that living sacrifice that God wants to give to us. But it's easy to hide behind the words. It's easy to hide behind the schedules and all of the conflicts. And yet God continues to challenge us. And he says to those religious leaders who were trying to trap him, who were trying to confuse him, who thought they might get the upper hand, he realized that they were playing the game and that they would not succeed. And so it is with us today. As we work toward building the kingdom of God together, it's not the preacher, it's not just the Sunday school teacher, but it's everyone who is working and willing to serve. I don't know about your opinion of Jimmy Carter, whether he was a good president or a bad president. I do know that people would line up outside his church, the Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, Georgia, to sit in one of his Sunday school classes. Because even though he was president at one time, when he was at home, he would teach Sunday school. One visitor wrote that while he was impressed with the service and all of the activities that went on that day, what impressed him the most was what he read in the bulletin. For in the bulletin, down toward the end, was simply these words. Rosalind Carter will clean the church on Saturday, and Jimmy Carter will mow and trim the shrubs. Where are we in our service? 
Are we willing to share, to give, to lead, to care? To be a part of a fellowship and a church that makes a difference. Not because of the preacher or the leaders, but because every member of First United Methodist Church wants to make a difference in our community. And the authority that we have is the authority of God's love that has touched our hearts. And because of that, we love others. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.